Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 8, 2015, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week you're going to see. I really do mean it. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to need to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Make sure I get it all in. Make it some Mountain Dew. Do not compensate me for this. Pepsi, go you out there. Let me know. Red Bull said I was too fat. <laughs> I am too fat, but I'm working on that, and it's not just going to be a New Year's thing. I'm telling myself. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's the obligatory disclaimer screen. In case you don't know, you can lose money trading, and my favorite way to sum it up is all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Hey, do me a favor. Throw me a bone. You read the book, you like the book, not sure why else you'd be here if you're not following the methodology, unless you're like one or two people who like to come here and torment me every week, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> reason I beg for review, obviously egotistical purposes um, and uh, book popularity. And the, um, the other reason is occasionally you get a reviewer who reviews other reviews. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, who reviews... The reviewers and not the book itself, and that's the most stupidest thing I've ever seen. I can't imagine that um, people would do that. Um, somebody says they can't hear me. Uh, we've got fine. The sound is fine on this end, so there's probably like a squirrel or something got his nuts caught in a wire somewhere between me and you. Um. Anyway, all right. Sounds okay in the UK. Well, if we could make it to the UK, we could uh, we could make it anywhere, right? All right, what are we talk about? Uh, we're going to talk about overhead supply. And uh, I want to show how. Alan, reboot your computer. <laughs> Turn your speakers higher. <laughs> uh, what are we talk about? Well, I want to talk a little bit about overhead supply and behavior markets coming off of new highs. And as you know, I like to talk about current conditions and, and what lessons can be learned from them or what lessons I've learned in the past from them. Uh, IPO bull market of 2014 and uh, late 2013 is not dead yet and I've got some really interesting things to show you there and what else oh anything you want me to cover start thinking about it now and I'll be happy to uh, do that when we get to this when we get to the um, to the charts and we start going over your individual stock picks just uh, punch in your stock picks one at a time in the questions and hit return uh, you could ask about 15 stocks or 20 stocks or 100 stocks uh, just put put in one at a time. That way I'll know which ones I've covered and which ones that I did. And otherwise, um, it'll be kind of random as to which ones I cover. All right. Um, you may have seen this graphic before. It's one of my favorite graphics from an article I did a while back called the uh, Go Go Nomo. And the strategy is to actually short uh, efficient markets. And, you know, I do a lot of talking about efficiencies versus inefficiencies. In fact, I may have an article coming out soon in Traders Magazine on just that. And um, if you are to trade an efficient market, one of the best things to do uh, is to short them when they're coming off of high levels. Now, I don't want to digress too far into that. So what I'd like you to do, if you are interested in that, is read the article. And it's a go-go no-mo. And it's under education. Under education on my website, you can find that. Uh, but anyway, this graphic came straight from that article. And what I want to point out here is at a new high, by the way, markets, um, thank you, Wynn, markets, or I should say the bars, these little bars that you're seeing right here on your screen, there's nothing magical about those. That's the trading of people there are people behind bars okay so my point is that you you look at these bars and try to figure out who's who and what's what and predict where the market is likely to go or jump along or I should more accurately say jump on and follow along so at a brand new high like at this point a it actually closed at a brand new high anyone who has ever bought the stock is at a profit 
okay so everybody's a winner <laughs> when that market begins to drop anyone who bought above that point let's say we're down here around 80 something dollars a share so anyone above that point is now at a loss and that's known as overhead supply or overhead resistance depends on on how you want to talk about how you want to look at it okay now let's say that some people own the stock from way back here somewhere in here now these people are at a loss and as this market begins to deteriorate further these people are not only seeing their gains evaporate evaporate but they're seeing their gains turn into a loss so that's one of the things I'm going to talk about in just one second is that if this market continues to slide your buy and hope crowd or buy and hold crowd I should more accurately say but your buy and hope crowd is going to be punished a little bit and they're going to be be forced to see the reality uh, or forced with the reality of return of capital versus return on capital and those are two different things okay so once things start to get turned into a loss then you start begin to worry about getting your money back okay okay good uh, good questions Fred we'll get to those now let's talk about the behavior of markets that are near new highs let's talk about the players first you got the Johnny come lately's okay and they have a fear of missing out and as I often say the column is that they eventually throw in the towel and, and it's a horrible argument to to buy a market but where else are you gonna go and they kinda get faced with that 0, 0.0000 interest rate and they just watch this market go up day after day after day or year after year after year whatever the case may be and eventually they sort of throw it a town and they buy now this FOMO could often cause them to be the last in and the first out so the market comes up makes new highs finally they give in they buy like right here as soon as the market begins to roll over a little bit they're out okay that they're, they're like the so-called fast money now as soon as you do get a little bit of a blip down like this or even if the market is just making new highs sometimes you you get some eager shorts and they tend to confuse the issue with facts okay um, they might put some fundamentals to things and say, well, this market should not have a PE as high as it is, or the economy is not good, or blah, blah, blah. They have some reason why stocks can shouldn't be as high as they are. They are often right, but they are often very, 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 very early. They were right in 1998. In 1999, in early 2000, that stocks were overvalued. It should not be that high, okay? But they probably went broke in the process before that eventual bear market did come along. So, yeah, should stocks be going up 50 points a day? No, no, but they were, okay? I wonder if they like being right versus making money and I'm gonna come back to this theme and kind of a little bit of a tangent in just a few minutes but I wonder and I think so I think the answer is yes they tend to be heroes with e egos okay they want it to be they want that prize for calling that market top well the problem is that prize is gonna cost you a lot of money because you're gonna to have to predict early and often in order to get that prize and if you're wrong a number of times even though you're right eventually you're gonna run out of money and I think a lot of shorts do just that people that you know better do just that now let's talk about the market action and how it relates to these players let's say now we're talking about a market near new highs let me clean up this a little bit so we're talking about a market looks like this and then all of a sudden begins to do that okay 
Is it a pullback? I don't know. Is it something to start something bigger? I don't know. But if you end up with a route lower, if it begins to do this, then, of course, the Johnny-come-latelys, the JCLs, they're going to be the first to bail. Okay? The shorts are going to be getting to pile on, and this selling is going to be getting more selling. So you'll see even more of a route lower. Okay? And then, of course, the shorts will run in and cover real quick. It'll have a, the mother of all rallies and then turn over and die. But that's just one scenario where you get a, a route in a market where the market begins to implode. Why does it begin to implode? Well, the shorts pile on. The Johnny come lately is bail on their positions. Okay. And then the selling begets more selling. Why? Well, if you go back to graphics or one graphic, because these people who were losing open profits are now at a loss, okay, as this bar begins to drop. Anyone above the bar is at a loss who bought above the bar, okay? So if you're looking at the P's, we obviously stabilize and we've got a little bounce underway in here. But if we had drop down to here, then anyone, you know, it's going to be hard to make a perfect little line, okay? But you can see there's a lot of trading above where we are and a lot of people, a lot of potential overhead supply. Okay. So as that market continues to implode, it becomes a bit of a route. You get a lot of pressure put on people to think about return of capital versus return on capital, okay? You might need that money. That money might be in the market, and it might be your quote-unquote investment. But in the back of your mind, you're thinking, well, I could use that money to pay off that mortgage or because I need that, I need that money for retirement, but it's growing so well, I'm going to leave it there. And then all of a sudden, it begins to evaporate. Well, then all of a sudden, you're going to have to either work longer change your retirement plans, you know, maybe maybe you won't be able to retire in a double wide, you know. You might just have to retire that single wide, you know. So it, it's a reality check, okay. And, again, there's a big difference between return of capital and return on capital. And, there's a, and when you start losing that principle, um, psychologically, that becomes pretty tough, okay. Now, let's say we have a sell-off, and it snaps right back, okay? So, like we have now in the P's, maybe, just maybe, we might snap right back. Kind of like we did last time, okay? We snap right back. Kind of like we've been doing ever since 2009, okay? So, if we do snap right back, then what happens is the shorts get punished. And I think they're already getting punished in here. And from what I could tell, there's some eager shorts that got in over the last few days, and now they're already being punished. Now, these people are quick to bail out. So, they're kind of fickle in that when that market turns right around on them, they're quick to bail out. In fact, they help the market turn right around. If the market doesn't, follow through then they're they're already bailing out and how do you how do you exit a short you have to buy to cover so their buying could snap the market right back too okay now the Johnny come lately's it's possible that they hold on and maybe even pile on okay so the Johnny come lately's if it happens quick enough Okay, let's say the Johnny Come Lately is bought right here or right in here somewhere. All of a sudden, you're like, oh, oh, crap, oh, crap, right? And then the bar goes right back. Well, they're like, oh, whew. they breathe a sigh of relief. And then maybe even more Johnny Come Lately's come rushing into the market. And that's how you get a blow off kind of move because those shorts are covering. People are buying at, no co at any cost because of fear of missing out. And then you end up with a blow-off kind of move, and then the shorts come in and say, wait a minute, this is ridiculous, I'm going to short this market, and then they get burnt, and they get to cover again. Uh, someone once said that trends exist as long as people fight them. And that's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but if you think about it, 
it makes some sense. So as long as those shorts are going out there and shorting that market and they're being forced to cover, that market's going to continue to go higher. Okay, you can't quantify all that, but what you can do is you can look at the price. Okay. Now, if the market does come right back to new highs, like I've illustrated here up top here, then the longer-term holders breathe a collective sigh of release, relief, or, like I said over uh, recent columns in recent columns, a relative. Um, of mine approached me, was telling me how great his 401k had done. He pulled up his iPhone, he showed me all his funds. Most of them were index tracking funds, big cap funds, a couple small cap funds, but overall you add it all up at a quick glance, and I would say he had a portfolio that had a beta of about 99.9% uh, of the S&P 500, okay? So maybe 95%, okay? But at a quick glance, I guarantee you that if the S&P 500 goes up, his portfolio will go up and vice versa. If it goes down, it will go down. So I have a feeling that he probably didn't even notice this recent little market blip, okay, or even cared because especially since 2009, this is going to dovetail in nicely with some of the questions that are stacking up. But since 2009, the market's just come back every time it sold off. So people like, this relative of mine with his 401k is probably thinking, oh, it just came right back. Or he didn't even notice it, okay? So you got to think about the players in the market. Now, there's a fine line between thinking about them enough and too much. If you think about them too much, you try to figure it all out, and then it's just going to make your brain hurt. And you got to realize that markets are logical, and markets trade on emotions only. And once you get that, once you get past that, you do fairly well. And I'll tell people to think about your own emotions and, and catalog your own emotions. Think about your own personal ups and downs, your F-bombs and your hoorays, sometimes within the first, sometimes within 10 minutes of each other, right? Uh, just remember there's other people out there that are emotional creatures just like you doing the same thing, okay? So use the charts to try to Read the emotions of others. Steve says, what you resist, persists. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Fred says, is that the big top of that? Based on yesterday and today, so far, strong price increase in the major indices looks like the buy and dip set is alive and well, so the market continues to be a bad teacher. Um, probably. Ever since 2009, the market has come back. And like Judd Dotery wrote, or Greg Morris wrote about Judd Dotery and in, uh, Invest with the Trend, or Investing with the Trend, i got to get his book name right, um, that they said that active management should be questioned that has outperformed the market since um, 2009. Let me get the book right. Investing with the trend, I think. Yeah, investing with the trend right here. Uh, do read this book. Good, very good reading. Um, I got more gems out of it than I than I got um, more. You know, how to time the market, how to trade the markets, and all. I got more things that just made a lot of sense to me from um, um, market psychology standpoint than I than as far as indicators and all. But I do need to go through it. There's a play it's it's a doorstop. It weighs about thirty pounds. <laughs> so I have to go through the rest of it. I'm good friends with Greg, so uh of course I'm biased, but um good stuff in there. But like Dotary said, um you know, I hope I have his name right, from Standian Capital Management, they um Stadion Capital Management. Stadion Standian. Standian, I think. Anyway. I wish I had it in front of me. But it, he said that anyone who has outperformed the market since 2009 should be questioned because they likely have not taken the preventative caution steps or preventative measures to get out of the market. And I know a while back the market was selling off, and they were completely out of the market. $5 billion, $6 billion worth of fun, and they were out. Okay? Because they got signals that the market was rolling over. Well, the market came back. So what? Okay. Now the question is, how do you prepare for the eventual correction? Well, there's different ways of looking at that, but the easiest way is number one: 
and I'm going to probably touch on this anyway in a few minutes, but number one, honor your stops, okay? Uh, number two, assuming that the trend is coming to an end, but you don't know it yet, which, by the way, you won't, okay, for the most part. I mean, the only time in my career where I felt like it was the end and it really felt like the end was in 2008, around October or so, where I couldn't find a log to save my life. I had to apologize to my clients for putting shorts on the service, even though the market was at new highs. It just seemed like everything was abysmal back then. But 99.99 .99 other times, even if it does look a little iffy, you're probably going to be wrong on that top. So what you do is you do what you always do. You honor your stops. You take partial profits as offered, okay? We just had a couple in the portfolio hit partial profits, and when the market was at brand new highs, it kind of felt like, why am I bothering taking partial profits? The market's just banging out new highs. I can leave this position on as a full position and make a lot more money, okay? Well, your answer comes to you really quick. As soon as that market begins to sell off a little bit, then all of a sudden you see some of those open profits evaporate, like right from here to here, okay? And then you're thinking, well, wait a minute, maybe that was a good thing to sell partial profits out, okay? So, yeah, take partial profits on half of your positions as offered. So that way you're scaling out, and let's say you're scaling out, but the market conditions become a little iffy. Well, it's going to get harder and harder to find new positions. Lately, we had to have a lot of new positions on. Just got a client. Oh, you're not active enough for me. I'm, I'm quitting. Well, you know, being active and making money are two different things, okay? And I'm going to get to that in just one second. But you start scaling out as you're hitting those profit targets, and if the market's not offering you new positions, then you sit on your hands. So you're already reducing your exposure, you're raising that cash to begin with. Now, what else is going to happen? You're going to start to see a few shorts popping up. And you might take one or two of them. Okay, We haven't taken a lot of shorts over the last year or so, but we've taken a few, and a couple of them have paid off really nicely. So you're going to start taking a few shorts. So if the market begins to tank a little bit, yeah, you're going to get stopped out. Yes, you're going to give up some open profits, but you're actually going to start making a little money, okay? Now, it doesn't work out perfectly where your equity curve is going to look like eternal sunshine. Your equity curve is not going to look like uh, it's not going to look like this, you know, and just kind of flatten out and, go, and just keep on going. It's going to probably look like this and then like that again. Now, if you go, there's a YouTube I have on the discretionary portfolio. And I'm working to update those records. It's pretty tedious, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it out soon. And you'll see that, like, if the overall market begins to roll over, the market and the portfolio look almost the same. But if that market keeps dropping like this, then what happens is those shorts begin to kick in, and you actually begin making money, okay? Now, I hate the short side, but it's a necessary evil. We, we can get into that maybe later if, if time allows, okay? So... Let's summarize this. You take partial profits because that's scaling out and reducing your position size. You're selective on new positions because you're not seeing any anyway. So now you're raising cash automatically by taking those partial profits, okay? The third thing is you're honoring your stops. So that's going to raise more cash. You might lose a little bit of money, but you're certainly going to reduce your exposure, okay? And then the next thing is you're going to take a few shorts as they begin to present themselves. And if it all works out beautifully – then your equity curve stays uh, fairly gradually flat during the period or it doesn't uh, dip too much, and then you start making money again. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. That's a long-winded answer, I know. Okay, yeah, yeah, th this, is, this is hard. Uh, Shea's, Shea brings up an awesome point, okay? And, and trust me, I feel that performance anxiety – probably a lot more than, than some of you do because I've got, I don't know how many, but uh, let's just say, let's just say a hundred clients at any given time, okay? And they're depending on me 
to perform. So it's a lot of people depending on me, right? Okay, I got those kids in the house. They like to eat, you know. They won't stop eating. <laughs> Excuse me. So, yeah, there is a performance anxiety. One way you wrap your head around that performance anxiety is you know, you embrace, you live with your methodology. And the more you know your methodology, the better off you're going to be, the more cycles you live through, okay? It never gets easy, but it gets easier. So you know, which I, you know, a lot of the stuff I'm saying today I'm going to get to further on in this presentation, but you know that there's going to be some flat times where maybe six to even eight months and sometimes longer, you're not going to make much money, and then all of a sudden you're going to print money, okay? Most people give up before that print money phase, okay? Um, I have clients that's been with me forever, and I love them, and they love me, and it's a big, it's a big love fest. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I've never really marketed up until now. I'm beginning to market a little bit because it's a lot of work on the retail side, and it's not a lot of money unless you have um, enough clients to make it worthwhile. So I've started marketing a little bit, even though yeah, obviously I would pretty much do this for free because I enjoy it, but it is a lot of work. Anyway, before I digress too, for, too much, one person I was talking to said, that's, that's, you're living in a, that's a pipe dream to want to have clients like that. That's going to be one out of a hundred of your clients is that one person that sticks with you longer term and reaps the fruits of that labor. It's 99% of the other people are just going to come and go. Okay. And they will because what will happen is as soon as the market gets a little choppy, they're gone. They're going to go chase some rainbow somewhere else. They're going to go off looking for action. They're not going to stick around until that next trend comes along, okay? And then what's worse is they come in during good times, and then they print money, and they think it will always be like that. And then they leverage up, and then the choppy market hits them, and then they, they wipe out. So knowing your methodology is vitally important. And that helps you live through good times and bad. Like Douglas once said, I always quote Douglas. You always get something good out of him. And this was on a cassette tape. And bear with me for these people. You people here have heard me say this a thousand times. But he said, There's the difference between a good salesman and a bad salesman is a bad salesman makes a few sales calls and he gets rejected and he gets upset and he goes drink his lunch. And a good salesman makes a few sales calls, he gets rejected, and then he says, okay, well, I know that I've knocked out a few bad calls here, so by law of averages, if I keep at it, I'm, I'm due for a few good calls, so let me go grab me a cup of coffee, let me kind of dust myself off a little bit, get a little cup of coffee, and then I'm going to come here and pound it out and become successful and get some good sales in. So I, th I just thought that was a good analogy. So if you have a viable methodology, you get beat up a little bit. I mean, you do have to do a little introspection. You can't just, you know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. But if you do have a longer-term viable methodology and it starts to underperform, then that's a good thing because you know it's due to start performing soon, okay? And, you know, it's kind of perverse. This, this business is kind of perverse because... When I'm in the print money phase, I'm not happy because I know that I'm due for the not print money phase. I'm due for a choppy phase. I'm due for a big drawdown. So you never get extremely happy, at least not for long, okay? And, and after, but the longer you do this, the more, I hate to say boring, but for lack of a better word, the more boring it becomes. You no longer crave the action. You just, you no longer care about being right. You just learn how to chip away at it and embrace your methodology and take things as they come, okay? Samson slew 500 men with the jawbone of an ass. Many salesmen kill sales in the same, with the same weapon by jawboning. Are you saying I'm jawboning? 
Uh, Shay, I think it's a bad idea. What do you think about trading? Shay's asking this. He says, what do you think about trading more than one methodology at different time frames? Um, I don't think we're wired to make that many decisions. Okay, let's, 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 let's separate those two questions out. <clears throat> First of all, let's say you're trading methodologies and, and uh, you're, you're changing methodologies. This, this is something I talk about quite often. So let's get a blank screen up here. And I can almost guarantee you this will happen. I can, uh, all, I can all but guarantee this will happen, okay? So let's say the market's trending. Okay, well, I'm going to be a trend follower. And now it starts getting choppy. So, oh, I'm going to start trading a, uh, a choppy market system, okay? And let's call this a CMS and a trend following system, okay? Or let's call it mean reversion and trend following. Let's do that. Okay, I'm getting back to the markets. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, in theory, we're going to we're going to trend follow when the market's doing this, and we're going to mean revert trade when it's doing this. Meaning we're going to sell here, and we're going to buy here. Okay. Well, let's say we look at the market. It's like, oh, it's obviously in a MR phase, so I'm going to sell the market here. Okay, so what happens? The market begins to trend. Okay, my system says, well, let's let's sell it here because now it's mean reversion. It's super duper overbought. So what happens? It continues to trend. Okay, so right around here, it's like, oh well, Big Dave's drawing these these uh, blue arrows. He's been drawing these blue arrows for six months. I think it's time to start trend following. So let's start trend following right here. Okay? What happens? Market begins to mean revert. Oh, wait a minute. Aha! I recognize this condition. This is a mean reversion type of market. So let me sell it right here because it's high. Then what happens? Okay? Rinse and repeat. I've seen this happen a thousand times. Okay? Now, Let's say you want to trade um, both daily charts, okay, and then intraday charts, okay? Well, the problem with that is, let's say you're looking at this intraday chart. It looks like it's the end of the world, but this might just be like a little bit of a blip on a daily chart. That might be right, right, right there, okay? So if you start watching that that intraday chart, it's going to look like the end of the world, and it's going to be very hard to switch time frames from one to the other. One of the hardest clients that takes me the longest time to fix is the day trader, the, the day trader that realizes, that comes to his senses and realizes that they're going to kill themselves by looking at every little tick all day long and watching every little up and down and they want to become a longer term trader they want to become that swing to intermediate term trader to trade this hybrid approach like mine or mine exactly well the problem is as soon as like this little blip comes in they're so busy looking at this intraday chart that they sell everything and then all of a sudden the market takes off so very hard to switch hats between day trading and uh, interday trading, okay? Between that day trading and let's say swing the intermediate term trading. Very hard to switch hats, okay? Very hard to switch methodologies because you're always going to be out of phase. Now, I knew a trader once if the market was reversed and he said, oh, I'm, I, you know, I sold that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trading reversals now. If the market was traded, he was a trade trader. No matter what the market was doing, he was doing it. And... I'd be willing to bet really good buddy, a lot of good buddy, that he's FOS and he just wants everybody to think he's right. Nobody is that good. If he was that good, then um, he would own the world. Maybe hey, fully invested now. If now percentage of your portfolios you're in, we'll look at that. We'll look at that in one second. I'll pull it up. <clears throat> we'll pull it up. Okay, Nate says, been there, couldn't agree more. 
Oh, perfect, perfect. He said he had ZLTQ at 9. He sold at 11-ish today because of intraday charts, and now let's take a look at it. All right, we got a live example. ZLTQ, ZLTQ. Okay. ZLTQ? What did he say? Is that right? He sold at 11. Okay. All right, so he sold at 11 because the internet chart told him to, and now it's at 28. <laughs> so, okay, I guess the original question was uh, patients with performance anxiety. If you know and embrace the methodology, you just have to, you just have to tough it out, okay? Um, you know, one of the, one of the, and I've said this a thousand times, I'll say it a thousand more, but one of the beauties of me joining this professional organization that I'm in, the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts, is that, you know, not only you get to, to hang out with some of the, some of these, uh, you know, the who's who of all these guys and, and learn from them, but you also learn that they're no different from you or me. They get pissed off when markets aren't doing what they think the market should do. They're still human, and they still have drawdowns, and it's just a wonderful thing to realize that, you know, that's a big, that's a big step. That would you take in the markets? Would you realize that you're not a dumbass, okay? <laughs> in that no one else has the answer either. Now I think I have a very plausible approach, but I don't have all the answers, okay? But I think I have a very plausible approach, and for me it makes a lot of sense. But you realize when you realize that those guys get pissed off too, and those guys have bad quarters and bad weeks, months even maybe years, then your life gets a lot easier. Wynn says, 20, 30, 40, what price level do you think an IPO is priced too high and might not have the good potential to go higher? Um, well, Wynn, just uh, rewind that IPO course, which I'll uh, soft sell here in just one minute, and I will answer that exact question. <laughs> uh uh, well, it depends. There's a price level I look at for certain patterns, and then if um, if it's over that threshold, then I look for secondary patterns. Okay. RFMD. Oh, it was RFMD. Sorry, RFMD. Oops, RFMD. Why is that not coming out? Well, you know what? Learn from your mistakes. Um, you're not a dumbass. We're all, you know, we all make mistakes. Or what's wrong with this thing? QBR, QR. That's a that used to be a real stock. Why is it not coming in? Oh, QVRO. Okay. Nope. QRPO. Here we go. <laughs> okay. John Davidson says, IPO course worth every penny. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. I can assure you he's not a show. Okay, uh, let me wrap up this um, this high-level sell-off thing real quick. Don't anticipate. Wait, okay? You know, sometimes I almost feel... Um, What's the word? Uh, like maybe people weren't going to be impressed with my my bow tie pattern or something because it's too simple. Okay? Sometimes I feel that pressure. But the reality is, let's say the market's selling off. It's like, well, let's just wait to see if we get some sort of sell signal such as a bow tie. Now, let's look at this last little sell-off. Let's see what happened. Well, we didn't get a bow tie. Okay, it looked pretty ugly, but the market turned around and went right back up. Now we got this sell-off here. Looked pretty ugly two days ago. But let's just wait to see if we get a sell signal like a bow tie. Okay, 
And that's kind of, you know, it's weird. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around that. It's like it takes you years to realize that it does not have to be nearly as complicated as you think. Once you realize that nobody has all of the answers, as long as you do something that's conceptually correct, I borrowed that term from uh, Larry Connors many years ago, then follow it. So don't anticipate wait. So if you waited for a bow tie, you wouldn't have sold the last sell-off. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not honoring your stops. Yeah, honor your stops at individual issues. You get stopped out, so what? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, someday it will not come back and it will be ugly. But what you have to think of is till then, okay? 2009, you know, I mean, we had some pretty ugly markets. And yeah, if if you get a signal, we had a, we had a bow tie signal recently, and we started putting some shorts on. Okay, why? Because well, the market was selling off, and we had a signal. And you know what? The market dropped eight percent from that bow tie. I mean, look at that. That's a bona fide bow tie, coming off of all time highs. In fact. It's a secondary signal. In fact, if you go back and watch my webinars from back in October, you probably heard me say, hey, guys, this looks like a pretty serious sell signal. And the market did drop about 8% from that. So that's a pretty serious sell signal. Now, <clears throat> hang on one second. How many times do I have to tell you? <laughs> anyway, so you can see you had a nice little signal here, and then you had about an 8% sell-off. It did turn into the mother of all trends, but it was a decent sell-off nonetheless, somewhat tradable. And then now we've – it didn't quite bow tie. It went right back up. But if you watch for a first thrust, it went right back up, okay? Now, this thing could form a gatekeeper or something in here, and it could still be ugly. I'm not going to start – or I should say, let's not start kissing each other just yet – but so far, it's coming back nicely. And if you try to anticipate too much, I think that's when you could get in trouble. So don't anticipate. Wait for the signals. Now, again, someday it will come back and will be ugly. That last sell signal we had in the bow tie, it dropped 8%. It could have easily dropped, not as easily, but you know what I'm saying, it could have dropped 80%. NASDAQ lost 70% of its value in 2000. And I bet if you went back and looked at it, I guarantee you there were sell signals, okay? So that's where it kind of dovetails in or kind of agrees with what uh, Judd Dotery said over at, uh, however they say the name of the company. I guess I can learn how to say the name of the company. <laughs> Stadion uh, Capital is that people who, you know, non-active management needs to be questioned because, one of these times, the sell-offs is not going to work, okay? Okay. Now, we've been talking about IPOs for a long time. We had an awesome bull market in IPOs in 2014. And when we last left off here in December, uh, middle of December, 18, my last show here, because of the way the holidays fell this year. We had two Thursdays in a row. Uh, we were talking about IPOs in 2014. Now, somebody asked me about the portfolio. This is the, this is the model portfolio for the trading service, okay? And it's on a hypothetical 100K account. And sometimes I, have, I put the math in here. And if you want, I could... Uh, I could do the math in here for you, and you, if you want this spreadsheet, let me know. Just to, I'll give you the open spreadsheet. Um, but if you wanted to see how much of the portfolio was invested based on this, you would multiply the. Um, I would go by the original price, 
Well, which multiply the original price times the number of shares, okay? And then that would tell you how much of uh, the portfolio would be invested and add them up. I could do that. I could I could add that column. If you want me to, I'll add that column over here and just shoot me an email. I'll give it to you. And then that way you can track how much is invested. But we do scale out. So that one is at the profit target, and that one is at the initial profit target. Uh, this one not yet. This one and this one not yet, okay? And obviously it's UEC kind of sticking up the joint. Uh, one reason I'm showing you this is look at the look at the difference that outlier makes. Okay, so far so good. 61% gain. That's a decent amount of money, and that's the majority of the money um, in the open profits. Okay. So so far the kite is flying, and this is a relatively new issue. Okay. So far so good. We're trailing that stop higher. Looking pretty good. Didn't didn't go straight up though. Notice that. See, this is what you have to learn how to live through. This is why you can't micromanage yourself out of trades. Put them on. Got your stop. Good to go. All right, let it happen. Uh, now, one of the things I said was we were talking about uh, 2014 of the IPOs that are in the core service. Now these are uh, higher volume IPOs than the IPOs that that were recommended in the follow-up sessions and in the original session of the IPO course. So as a private trader, if you're trading IPOs, you can go in with some of those thinner issues because they're not fully established. You don't know exactly where the volume is. You could take a little bit more chances as a private trader. As opposed to a bigger trader, you, you couldn't get enough shares anyway, as opposed to like a fund manager. So that's one advantage you have. But you can see that so far so good, and what's helped things along is uh, that those uh, kite, that one trade beginning to fly in here, okay? Now, since the last week in charts, uh, this, is, this was uh, left over from the last week in charts, and one of the things I said was there's no real outliers to speak of, but the year ain't over yet, and then kite didn't take off quite at the end of 2014, it took off over the last couple of weeks. So it's like it's like early 2015. And that's, again, that's the importance of that outlier. Now, let's just get back to psychology for a second. I mean, this is what always happens. Not always, but quite often. Okay? You know? It's like, uh, Dave, quit the service. It's like, uh, well, okay. Well, what's wrong? It looks like we're doing okay. Uh, did, you get, did you get kite? No, I got UEC. <laughs> you know? That's the only one I took. I can't make any money. You know? So... You recommended that stock, and look at it. It's just stinking up the joint, so I can't make any money. I quit. All right, well, you know, without Kite, you're not going to make any money, and possibly the CTLT, you know, and then hopefully Ruby and these other ones. But the point I'm trying to make is a lot of times it's that outlier where you make most of your money. There will be times when I'm really right, and I'll have like eight or nine stocks, and they'll go up to hit the profit target, and I'll make – you know, a little money on all of them, then scratch out. It's like, well, oh, that was that was kind of fun. That you know, I was right nine out of ten times, or ten out of ten times, but I didn't make any real money. But if you get that one or two big outliers that goes up four, five hundred, six hundred percent, then you're making real money. Okay. So so far so good on these IPOs. I added in early 2015 just because a couple of those were taken off. Well, especially just that one kite for now, okay? So, again, the, the reoccurring theme is that your outliers really make a big difference, okay? And I updated this from um, last time. These are the, the IPOs that are the follow-up sessions. Uh, the last session, we had quite a few trigger, and a couple things have happened. Um, some have taken off, like this one, and then come back in, have come back in. And some are a little flat. So we have had quite a few triggers. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if the bull market continues in the IPO, especially since so many of those have triggered. Um, I still think outliers, like at a core methodology or key to trend following. And there's a bit of a champagne problem. And, again, I don't have all the answers, as I've said quite, a, quite before. Uh, often before, you know, how do you handle the windfalls, especially due to the fly and die nature? Also, there's not options on them, so it's tough. 
So this is one that triggered from the last session, okay, and it took off, and then it came right back in and stopped out. So the problem is you need a very wide stop on these, especially when that volatility just explodes like this, and the stop on this one was at about 38%. That sounds like a tremendous amount. But had it retraced, I mean, that's only like one or two days move. Had it retraced less than that and it took off again, you'd have been in that longer-term trend. So maybe I'm trying to solve for a problem that's not solvable. Um, you know, if there's options opens up a can of worms, they're not optionable just yet. So that's, that's one thing to think about with some of these. Okay. Um, but so far, the IPO market is alive and well. This isn't necessarily a chronological graph because some of these positions that are open, uh, it, it's cumulative, though, okay? If you add everything up, okay, it's cumulative. So, like, this is a winning trade here, um, and this would be some losing trades that happen, okay? But your open position, this open position, like here, might have been opened way back here, okay? So it's not necessarily in chronological order, but this is as of this morning, as of last night, these were the IPOs. This is the performance of the IPOs that were recommended in those follow-up sessions. So, so far, so good. The point is that the IPO bull market so far is alive and well. Here's the beauty, though. A lot of the ones, a lot of the IPOs recommended did this. It just flat out did not trigger, okay? And that's the dichotomy that I spent a lot of time talking about in that course. It's like... Um, a peer of mine, I, I, I gave him the course because he's a peer of mine. <laughs> he's like, that thing is long. It's like, <laughs> I guess he thought he would watch it in like 30 minutes or something. It's like, he's like, yeah, it's it's it takes a while to explain all that. So he has he hasn't watched the whole thing yet. I don't know. I don't think that's a compliment that it's long, but a lot of information in there. But one of the things you'll see that I talked about a lot, and I kind of beat the dead horse on, is there's a huge dichotomy between the losing ones and the winning ones. And you could miss a lot of losing trades just by waiting for setups. And that's the beauty. One of the, one of the beauties of the IPOs is that they either fly or they die. So, again, that is, that has a, it is a bit of a problem that has showed up is how do you handle the big windfalls, you know. And, and I don't have the answer. I don't know if there is an answer. But maybe if you're up 200% over three or four days, then you need to think about lightening up on that position. And maybe that is the answer. I don't know. But I'm going to chew on that a little bit because you kind of hate to see uh, such big gains evaporate. Now, someone quit the service like right as I'm going to press with this meeting this morning. And so I gave him kind of a quick reply. But... They said that it wasn't active enough. Now, what's kind of ironic is when the markets are, let's say we get a rip-roaring market and things are just going and going and going and trending like crazy, I'm recommending two, maybe three stocks a day. I get emails from people, whoa, 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 you're too active, okay? <laughs> so keep in mind that I'm as active as I need to be, and so should you. I'm as active as I need to be. Now, if, you, if I'm not active enough, why would you say that? Are you looking for action, okay, or are you looking to make money? And there's a big difference between those two. And let me tell you a quick little story. Back when I was with trading markets and they asked me to do a trading service, that's how this whole, that's how this whole uh, retail business got started. I was on the institutional side, uh, kind of behind the scenes kind of guy. And Larry Connors discovered me through a friend of mine who, uh, actually a friend I met through an article when I decided to make myself a little bit more public, I guess. But I never intended to end up in retail. And uh, trading markets asked me if I would do a service. And sure, you know, I was doing the homework anyway. Why not? But back then, if I recommended four stocks, and they were all crap, I wouldn't lose clients. But if the markets got iffy, and I didn't recommend any stocks because the markets were iffy, then I would lose clients. And the salespeople would call me up, please, 
put more recommendations or please recommend more. People want action. It's like, that's kind of a hard thing for me to do, knowing that they're just going to lose money. It's like, so I'm, I'm supposed to put out crap so the salesperson can make some money and I can make some money on this thing because people just want action. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe my whole mindset is wrong about the retail business. Maybe I just need to give them what they want, you know? But I, I it's, it's like someone a while back was telling me about somebody, and they will tell them about what they made a month. And uh, my wife said, yeah, but can they sleep at night? And it's true, you know? Can you sleep at night? Yeah, well, you know, God bless you if you can, and you're making a lot of money by taking and not giving okay so that's why i you know my goal obviously is to is to recommend to take action only when action needs to be taken okay don't do anything unless there's something to do something really great to do make sure you really really like a setup okay great trades don't come along every day might have to wait around a little bit before we get the next kite Okay, but if you work at it, if you chip away at it, they will um, they will come. Did you watch the movie Network recently? I've never seen Network. Uh, keep in mind that even in short to intermediate term trading, there still it still takes time. Usually six to eight months, and occasionally longer. You know, one of the things that amazed me was even if you're a floor trader. I don't know if that people could remember when they were floor traders, but if you're a floor trader in and out all day, they might be. Sometimes there are streaks where uh, floor traders could go actually weeks and even months without being in the black. And it comes with the territory. So every, no matter how active, quote unquote, active you are, you might go a long time. In between peaks, in other words, uh, that's a, that's another way of saying drawdowns. Okay, so you might, you know, the distance between your equity peaks could be could be a while, and it doesn't matter what methodology you're using. The problem with being more active is you might be exposing yourself to less than ideal markets, and then you might get whacked pretty hard. And if you're not holding on to those longer-term winners and you get a couple of outliers against you that get away from you, you could be in a lot of trouble really quick. You have a little empathy. No one on the sell side typically does. I have a little empathy? <laughs> what does that mean? I think that's a compliment. You have been proven correct when it compared to the IPO, ETF, IPO. Are you, are you quoting from the uh, course? I'm not sure what you're saying. Okay, Alan says, in language, you're right that the stop placement is arbitrary. Well, it's not completely arbitrary. Uh, there is some, some reasoning to it. Uh, it's an art more than science. And you state that you're looking to place it outside of the normal volatility. How do you find the balance? Um, I've tried to quantify that best I could. And then there is really no way to quantify it. You just, if it's stocks bouncing around four or five points a day, you know you're going to need a bigger stop than four or five points, okay? That's the first thing. Uh, you look at the historical volatility of the instrument and you see how high it is. If it's up towards triple digits, you're going to need a tremendously wide stop. Where is your, where would the trade fail is another way to look at a stop and then factor in volatility too. I mean, if it's something like a gatekeeper, Okay, this is this is a, this is a no-brainer, right? Because if it goes on to make new highs, you know you are wrong. Let's say like some the market like bottoms out or something makes a bow tie. Okay, this would be like a saucer in a hand or a bow tie, whatever you want to call it. And then it begins to take off, and then it comes right back in. If it comes back to the old lows, you know you're wrong. The problem with like a pullback is, how do you know if it's just completed that pullback to take off, or it just becomes something bigger? And the question is, you don't. So you have to eyeball that volatility. The wider your stop, the better the chances of catching a trend. But obviously, the more you're going to lose, 
percentage-wise and point-wise. However, the wider you stop, the fewer shares you're going to trade. I, I did a um, webinar sometime last year on the on uh, is a, a lower price stock. I'm sorry, is a lower volatility stock more or less volatile to trade? or dangerous to trade than a higher volatility stock. And I think the the answer might surprise you. I'll give you the answer. The the higher volatility stock is less risk, believe it or not, because you're compensating by trading fewer shares. Okay? So, yeah, Alan, it's an art as much as a science, but if you're getting stopped out a lot, as I preach, you need to do two things. One, make sure you're picking the best markets to begin with. And two, if you think you are, then loosen your stops a little bit. Your stops are too tight, okay? And it takes a little bit of experience, but, um, you know, you want them just loose enough to withstand the worst. I don't want to get into system talk, but they have the maximum, what is it, maximum adverse excursion or something. Uh, in system talk, there's, you, it's like they expect in system development that you're going to get whacked at least so much, okay, as a general rule before, the trade becomes profitable, so that's that's where you want that stop to be. Uh, give it enough room to breathe, okay? And it's an art as much as a science, and that's why mechanical systems. I'm not a big fan of those things. Uh, David really liked your gatekeeping example because stop based on chart formation is a premise of the trade. Yeah, that's one. That's a beauty. That's a beauty of that too. And then if if you um, it's like in the IPO course too. We've got some what I call some pioneer setup. So let's say the let's say the market. Let's do this, <clears throat> and this is what I've been um, and this is how I've been trading these. And and you know you know, so what you get stopped out. So what? It, it, I know it takes a while to get to that point. But let's say you get an IPO. It comes out. It does this, okay, and then it begins to take off. And then you've got that. You got your little buy setup right here. Well. Where am I wrong? Well, I'm wrong if it comes down here and makes new lows. I'm wrong for sure, okay? Now, that's a um, a feature, a characteristic. I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for. An anomaly, maybe, of IPOs because you have limited trading data and all, and you know that if it makes new lows, you're wrong as a trend follower, okay? So that's an exact – it's like – I do have a pattern that's almost mechanical because I got the breakout characteristic. This is the a hard and fast rule, and then the other hard and fast rule is it should not make new lows after this trigger. Okay, does it always work? No. Okay, but when it works, it works big. And when you're wrong, you're wrong. You know you're wrong. Okay, you get out. So what? Live to fight another day. Yeah, that's uh that that IPO ETF is by um uh, who are those people? Um they specialize in IPOs. Yeah. So yeah, you want to avoid uh IPOs that are ETF IPOs, okay? I guess in time over the next year maybe we'll get the whole course out at 5 minutes at a time. <laughs> Don't be greedy, John Davidson. I agree. You said it's not a good position. It's not a good idea to jump into a position at a 44 trigger. I didn't understand that. Uh, that might have been like an IPO, uh, with it, with based on there's a breakout strategy I use that I have a um, a price uh, a cutoff on those. And and as I said in the course, the price cutoff was based on what I've seen empirically over the last few years. That 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 price level. Could be subject to change. Let's say we get a rip roaring bull market next year. That'd be fantastic. Then maybe I'll bump that price level up a little bit. Or if things deteriorate, maybe that price level will come down a little bit. It's just an anomaly that there's that word again. I noticed with IPOs. Okay. Okay. A generic question If RFMD and TQNT merged into QRVO, on 1215, and RFMD was one for one for QRVO stock. What would a previous share of RFMD be worth? If it's one for one, it should be the same, right? I don't know. It's kind of making my brain hurt. RFMD one for one, QBRO. 
Well, if it's one for one, then it should be worth the same as the prior stock. If they're trading one for one, okay. Alan says, well, you said it in layman's. There's a money management and position management. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you know, maybe that's something I don't focus on enough is the position management. And that's where, and that's pretty easy because you're just letting that stop widen out, okay? Uh, you know, one other thing on stops I wanted to point out because it's a, it's a good, it's good that we got into this. You know, let me, let me just point out something, you know, Kudos to you guys for, for asking money management questions. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again and again and again. If I go speak somewhere, I get after the I get done, the stage gets flooded, and people are like, uh, uh, can you tell me about the gatekeeper, or can you tell me about a bow tie, and blah, blah, blah. Everybody wants to know about setups. So that's fine. I'm flattered. I, I'll talk about setups all day long. But then there's like one or two guys or, or gals, and they want to ask me a money management question. Well, if I had to pick out of the bunch who's going to make it, it's the one or two people that ask me the money management questions. So when you reach a point in your career where you're asking money management questions, you've either made it or you're close to making it, okay, because you get it. Now, getting back to that, occasionally with, like I said a second ago, occasionally with a setup, let's say you have like a witch hat. Okay, let me make an extreme example of a witch hat. Ooh, Chief Allman really wound up today. Uh, how do we make a screen, white screen? <clears throat> okay. Say you have a witch hat, okay, and you're looking to sell that market. Well, you know it really, you still need to give it room, okay? And that wiggle room would probably suggest to be about right here. So as a general rule, you probably want to give it the normal amount of room. But if you wanted to take a poke at it or take a stab at it, you might be able to put it a stop right above this high because if this thing triggers, it shouldn't go on to make new highs in this witch hat because this market is stretched so far already, okay, and it's got a little bit of resistance in it. So that might be a case where you could use a tight stop. Let's say this market gaps open and begins to come back in. Maybe that's a way to get a head start on a swing trade, okay. I'm not saying day trade, but you can get a head start on a swing trade, and then maybe you could put a stop in right above that high. So every now and then, the market might give you a pattern where you could use a fairly tight stop that might be, let's say, within that normal volatility of that market, okay? Okay, uh, can you talk about uh, talk for a bit about the when you decided to you like to tra risk 2% per trade instead of 1% or 0 0.8 or 1.2 or whatever. Did you used to risk more or less? Uh, just curious. Uh, I used to probably risk a lot more, but uh, obviously the, you end up you end up all over the place when you're risking a lot. I think when I when I caught a f my first few outliers at 2%, and I realized that you could really make a lot of money at 2%, okay? Now, 2% is plenty enough to get hurt, too, right? Let's say you log 10 times in a row. That's 20% drawdown. That's substantial. But hopefully you position yourself so that, that doesn't come along that often. I'm not going to say it can happen, but hopefully you get more and more selective, and then you get a few winners mixed in to where you dampen that out. Um, so there's no there was no real epiphany in it. Uh, you know, maybe in the in the mid nineties or, or or maybe even a little uh later nineties when I was uh uh you know, maybe back before the trade trading market days or something, I finally realized that I was risking too much in my trades. I mean it was a lot more fun. And I preach this all the time. It's like hey, this is uh like the gentleman earlier looking for action. It's like you know, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to make money, you're gonna find trading pretty boring. Okay, because if you're risking only a small amount on every trade, um, but I just kind of happened upon that two percent, and it just seems to kind of click with me. 
Um, I messed around with a lot of stuff in my career, and I spent a lot of money messing around with a lot of stuff. Um, you know, there's there's like formulas out there that'll tell you you risk a heck of a lot more than that. And the flaw in those formulas is that they they are statistically based, and markets aren't normally distributed. So, yeah, Mike, I don't really have a good answer for you other than um, I just kind of kind of ended up there, you know. Okay, uh, sorry to ask more. RFDM, RFMD closed at 14 and QBR opened at 70. Is my old share of RFMD worth 14 or 70? Uh, well, this is what you do, Nate. Are you still in a position? Pull up your brokerage account and see how many shares of QBRO they gave you. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I don't have the answer for that. Um, but if it's one for one, you know, look it up on the internet. If it's one for one, then yeah, that's your shares are worth seventy dollars. But it's, it's probably not exactly one for one. All right, RFMD was a reverse split. Okay, so divide that by four, and that's what your shares are worth. Okay. Yeah, do a little research. That's it. That's a reverse split. Okay, well, yeah, I don't know. I, no, it's a reverse split, so divide that by four. So you left $5,000 on the table, okay? Eric says, and Eric's a client of mine, uh, he says, any good trader does does it. I, I say that so I don't, in case I praise him with love, you'll know why. <laughs> any good trader doesn't do this for the excitement. Taking the emotion out is critical to success. Your volatility stops and position sizing take care of this. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't take all emotions out because, as uh, Shull said, uh, you can't make decisions without emotions. So you have to embrace those uh, emotions. Trying to strike a balance between the two. Gotcha. And that's between money management and position management. Okay, uh, a little housekeeping before we get uh, to the charts. I know I kind of went long today, but you guys, uh, what do you call that? Flushed me out a lot. It was great. Uh, stock selection course so far. I haven't decided when I'm going to end it, but at some point I will. That I could promise. But uh, right now it it's, uh, seems to be popular, so we'll, we'll keep with it for a little while longer. If you get a stock selection course, you get a, a year free to the service. Okay. So the stock selection course is fourteen fifty seven. The service is fourteen fifty seven. So you get that for absolutely free just by getting the course. Um, Two thousand and fourteen archives of the weekend charts. I have ready. I don't have the. Um, I don't have them completely indexed yet, but you could look at the first few slides and see what each one's about. You can watch them all anyway. So if you want those, uh, see the store on my website. Let me show you what that is real quick, and then we'll get into things. Talk about yourselves. Uh, on the home page, just click on store right here. And then, again, with the stock selection course right here, you get one year of the trading service. And the archives to these weekend charts. Uh, each year is put onto a flash drive. It's about 150 hours, maybe, or something. I forget how many hours. 100 hours. That's a lot. 75 hours. What's an hour and a half times 50? A lot. 75 hours. <laughs> 75, 80 hours each. So a lot of good information, uh, if I say so myself. A lot of information for a lot of bang for your buck with those uh, flash drives. I'm very excited about them, and I think it's just a tremendous – I know it's kind of vain, but if I say so myself. Uh, trading services down here, you can start off with a low rate if you have it uh, – uh, if you've never been on the service, if you have been on the service before and you want to come back, uh, tell me, you know, shoot me an email, talk to me, just talk to me, and uh, maybe I can cut you a, cut you a pretty good deal, too. I'm, I'm pretty easy. I just have to explain it to my accountant, which is, uh, she, lives, she lives next door. I'm sleeping, I'm sleeping with my accountant, so that makes things kind of, uh, kind of difficult. <laughs> She's pretty hot, too. All right, enough of that nonsense. Let's take a look at this market. 
and I kind of fleshed it out a little bit already. But let's take a look at this market, and then let's uh, let's work our way out to the uh, sectors and everything else. Got cam? What does that mean? <laughs> Okay, P's, as you know, had a pretty serious slide. So far, bouncing back. What are they going to do? I don't know. I, I host a weekly show. I've been asked to host last uh, five or six uh, weeks. And uh, got camera? What do you mean? Uh, you don't, don't want to see me today. <laughs> um, and part of the question is, is the survey done? Like, where's the market going to be a, a week from now? And... You know, someone asked me because I, I said you could only predict a short term when it comes to markets, and they confused that with you could always predict a short term. No, you can't always predict a short term, but if you have a nice pullback in a stock that's an inefficient stock, art IPO, whatever the case may be, and it's a pattern you like to trade, then you could predict with a fair amount of certainty where that stock will be maybe a week from now based on that pattern. Okay, you never know for sure. But you can only predict the short term, but you can't always predict the short term, okay? And that's one thing that we do in this weekly show with the panels. It's for timingresearch.com. If you go to my website, it's on the home page. And um, he hasn't updated it for this week yet, but uh, I'm probably going to be the, the, the guest host again this week. And it's just kind of fun little show to do. Um, but one of the things we do is kind of like something that goes against what I – I know let me talk about this um, timing research panel right here. Uh, it kind of goes against it. It's like, well, let's, let's predict the market for next week. So, um, and that's hard to do. And, you know, I don't know. Where's the market going to be a week from now? I don't know. But we're going to follow along. And if this market starts making new highs again, then I'm going to say that the longer-term trend remains in place. One thing that has me a little bit concerned is that if you take a look at all the indices, you've got this problem is that on a net net basis we haven't made a lot of forward progress in a couple of months so as a trend guy I'm nervous that I'm gonna have to start drawing drawing this arrow the sideways arrow the dreaded sideways arrow okay question is S&P head and shoulders forming I don't know we'll see we'll know when we see it okay uh, just like somebody asked me about gold being ahead and shoulders or silver and I said yeah but you don't trade it until you get some sort of breakout. Here's silver. It's a beautiful head, shoulders, bottom. But you don't trade this pattern in and of itself. You wait until you get a bow tie or some sort of signal or a breakout and then trade the first pullback. So S&P head, shoulders, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Uh, could be a gatekeeper in here. I don't know. We'll have to let it flesh out a little bit. Let it, uh, let it trade. But so far, as you can see, this is why we don't rush out and sell a forum every time we have a little bit of a spill in here. NASDAQ, decent day there, too. Um, like I said in yesterday's column, it's not where the market starts. It's where the market ends. So market futures up 20 points. Well, let's hope by the end of the day we're up 30 points. And that way we know we've got some buying going into close as opposed to gapping over, open, and coming right back in. NASDAQ, a little sideways, too, as of late. You know, be ideally like to see break out and not look back for a while. Real estate, retail, and restaurants are banging out new highs in here. As you can see, take a look at bonds. Okay, uh, down a little today, but off of all time. Take a look at the yield. Okay, let's put up like a quarterly chart on this. Okay, so we're down here towards all time. Yields. That means, like, go back 100 years in history, and our yields are almost there. That's how low yields are now. So those of you with mortgages uh, might be a good time to start thinking about refinance, especially if you have a higher rate. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the sectors. We're kind of running out of time in here, but just know that a lot of them did kind of make these little double tops like the market itself. Be nice for them to get back to new highs. Uh, we might run into a little resistance or a little trouble in here. So you have to obviously take things one day at a time. Again, there's a couple areas in here doing really well. 
Uh, gold and silver continue to appear to be bottoming out, so we could see some setups there really soon. So I'm going to keep an eye on gold. There's gold, okay? And we'll keep an eye on silver, too, and see if we can find some setups there really soon, some uh, transitional type of setups, okay? Uh, no, any ideas on oil? It's just, you know, the trend follower in me wants to draw the arrow, okay? Um, now, I did have a speech I gave a while back about in use, okay? Uh, I'm not a bottom fisher. I don't want to be a bottom fisher. But in commodities, uh, there is an in use for the commodity. Okay, and that, the example I use is like toilet paper. Let's say the toilet paper market dropped, and you could get a roll of toilet paper for let's say a roll of toilet paper for five cents. And let's say that's a really good deal. Okay, let's say the historical price would be like a dollar a roll or ten dollars a roll, whatever. So you could buy a million, not a million rolls, but let's say a thousand rolls of toilet paper because you know at some point it has it has an end use, okay? So at some point you might be able to bottom fish a little bit if you were to run a fund in commodities where you might be able to bottom fish because there is an end use of these commodities. The problem is if you're using a futures market, then it gets messy because there's uh, all kinds of things that can happen. So at some point... The, the point I'm trying to make, at some point, oil is going to be a, a bargain. But the way I trade, the way I do things, it's going to have to make that first thrust of that bow tie. I'm not going to try to catch it as it's a, a falling knife, okay? So as far as Gump would say, that's all I have to say about that. Um, again, a lot of these sectors, hardware, software, and you got to have software for your hardware. Um all of them, kind of these double tops in here looking kind of iffy, okay? All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual issues. If you were to buy Vuzi, what price would it be? V-U-Z-I. V-U-Z-I. I don't have that one on my charts. V-U-Z-I. I don't have it. Never heard of it. Vuzi? What is that, Gary? I want to, maybe it's just TC hadn't updated yet. OCUL, <clears throat> this looks pretty good. Uh, this is a this is good good stock to start start to show with. Uh, my only problem with it, really on the thin side, it is still a, kind of a, an IPO. The original buy was back here. I do remember this one now. Um, so you can see it performed nicely as an IPO. Uh, a little on the thin side now, really thin. So I'd be careful with it, but it does have a double top knockout pattern to it. So I think it looks pretty uh, pretty interesting. Whether you enter at the at the knockout in here, or maybe try to get in a little earlier. But yeah, I think that looks great. Uh, except it's super thin. At this point, I mean, I would personally pass at this point in time because it's too thin. Uh, if you didn't play the original uh, IPO in that one, this one triggered. I think you got stopped out on that one. It sounds familiar. I have to go and look at the portfolio. Nate wants to look at C. Well, it's definitely trending, okay? It's a consumer non-durable, you know, snore. Uh, these stocks could be kind of uh, low in HV. So it's trending, but it's it's not really a thing I could get that excited about. It's like, okay, from here all the way to here, that's only two points. I mean, take a look at some of those IPOs we were just talking about, you know, uh, that have gone um, up 100, 200, 300 percent, like VTAE, for instance. MTSN. And yeah, it looks okay. It's a little few too many days in the pullback, but it, it's okay. It's not bad. Let's uh, back the chart out a little bit. Yeah, it's a little wide and loose longer term. I'm going to give it a not bad. I think it. I think it could possibly have potential. So yeah, that's a good look at the decent stock. Greg says ha. Well, ha back at you. Oh ha. You mean like Hawaiian Airlines? Yeah, you know, the only problem is it kind of lost a little steam in here. Um, and then where it is now, I would let it make new highs and then maybe look to play a pullback. But notice that it kind of took off in here, no pun intended, and then it kind of just went sideways uh, or in its drift. 
So I'm seeing a deceleration in trend and not an acceleration in trend. ML, bow tie of lows above resistance. ML, ML? Uh, I don't have that one. WR? Um, yeah, you know, WR looks okay. I'm seeing a lot of utilities that are set up. And I'm just having a hard time. Look at this, HV of, of 16. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about it. But, yeah, I agree with you, John. It looks great at first glance, but the HV is pretty low on that. Again, the move from here all the way to here is about two points, okay? So I just prefer to trade something a little bit more volatility. MIL? Boy, my eyes are shot. MIL. And... Well, this is what I call a forced bow tie, and that's not what the bow tie is designed to do. The bow tie is designed to catch a more gradual change in trend. So when you see a market go straight up like this, I kind of ignore the bow, the bow tie. So I would take the bow tie out, and I would just kind of see it as a first thrust, a little on the thin side, and has a mountain, no pun intended because it is a mining stock, of uh, overhead resistance. So I would pass on that one. F E Y E potential trend transition. I've been calling them emerging trends lately because it's easier to say. Uh, well, yeah, it's been bottoming for a long time. It would have to break out of this low level range for me to get excited. I hear you though. It looks like it's, it's trying to make a longer bottom. Could be like a Phoenix type of stock, like we talk about those every now and then. GXP. GXP. Uh, yeah, it's another utility, but it's already triggered. It's already rallying out of its uh, pullback. So it would have to make new highs and then pull back again. OCUL. But, yeah, you're going to find a lot of utility set up right now. Yeah, we covered this one. It's kind of thin. Looks good, though. <laughs> Jonathan says... Just know that the gold and silver stock actually will pull back right to those channels, those efforts. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get a lot of false breakouts, so be careful with that, obviously. AU, bow tie. Yeah, it's probably bow tie. Is it set up yet, though? It's not. It's, it hasn't pulled back yet. It's almost bow tie. And that's one of them that's on my watch list. Yeah, it looks that looks fantastic, okay? You do have a little overhead supply around 16, but, hey, you know what? If I make 60% on this trade, um, I'm going to be happy. So, yeah, on a pullback, that might be worthwhile. What does it look like longer term? Yeah, it's coming off of, like, multi-year lows, all-time lows. So, yeah, that needs to be on your radar, absolutely. You need to be watching that one. Job or Andre? Uh, no, this is a um, what I call a bottle rocket. Go in and watch the stock selection course. Uh, something that goes up like 400% or 500%, whatever, over a few days, it's very dangerous to trade that. I would run. Don't walk away from that. XNPT. Uh, well, this one's kind of bumping up against uh, resistance at its old highs. If you're already long, because it has accelerated higher, it looks pretty good longer term, then stay long. But I would not initiate a new position uh, yet. MPG is FDR. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Phil. Okay, I don't want to. Well, I can't talk about that because that's you're getting too far into the IPO course. That's another five. You know, we're getting the IPO, the IPO course is coming out five minutes at a time. Yeah, I fully agree with you on that one. Uh, NDRM. I think this one. Uh, yeah, this would this the fact that it just went it shot up too much in here. Uh, I would leave it alone based on that. It went from like eight all the way to eighteen. Um, so that's a tricky one. As far as uh, the entry is concerned, A T A X T A. Um, yeah, this looks okay uh, on a pullback, though. See, it's trending. It's a newer issue. It's trending on a pullback, absolutely. But it has a. Eh, it's okay. Let's just see what happens. If we can break up the new highs, maybe on a pullback. It's not the mother of all trends, but it is definitely a trend. Trill. Yeah, this looks good on a pullback. Okay. And this is one that actually triggered, uh, has already triggered way down here as a um, a pattern I call buy at B. So, yeah, I mean, you know, there's more 
fodder or evidence that the IPO market is still alive. RDI, no, this has lost too much uh, momentum in here. Notice that it went kind of up, and then it's lost momentum. So it would have to break out to new highs and then maybe uh, pull back. EGRX for win. Uh, I don't know. Maybe on a pullback. No, it's too thin. It's just way too thin. Uh, this was an IPO a while back. I hear you, though, because it's now making new highs, but it's now what I call a toddler. Uh, I would leave it alone just based on how thin it is. You know, maybe if it made new highs, it'd pull back, but... Boy, it's, it's really too thin now. CHRS, yeah, we're long that one, I think. Somewhere I'm long that one. Uh, this was a this was an IPO uh, that uh, that triggered on a breakout pattern. Uh, next pullback, absolutely, but not until it pulls back again. CEMP, you guys are just picking off the IPO list. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this is another one that, that triggered. Um, oops. Triggered on a breakout pattern, but yeah, on a pullback now. Okay, maybe on a pullback. I mean, it's kind of getting these act together. If you got long in the first breakout, then hang on. AMPH. Uh, no, let it break out and then maybe look to pull back again. Okay. Blue, blue kind of went straight up. Um, you know, this gap is just too extreme for me, so I would leave that alone. You know, if they gap up 100%, then it's eh, it's kind of crazy. Believe it or not, this one, I didn't personally trade it, but I put it in my, um, on this breakout, right, this breakout day right there on the close, I put that in my um, Landry 100 because it qualified as a stock making a new high on expansion and range. I had no idea it would double overnight. That's kind of that's kind of cool. It's kind of fun. I mean, I didn't make any money off of it, but it's I got bragging rights, right? <laughs> so I'll show it to you. Under 100. Should be in here somewhere. It better be. There it is, blue. And then reports. So you could see blue right there up uh oh up 14 percent why is it only 14 percent oh well take my word on it we added it the day before it, it took off i don't know why i did that oh i know why the reason is and, and now, now you think i'm talking about both sides of my mouth the reason is it's in my notebook on this day but i didn't update the database until two days later i swear okay next you swear? I swear. Um, no, you kind of got a minor double top in here. It's kind of rolling over. If anything, this could almost be a short at some point in time. Let's see. Yeah, I would leave that alone. If you're long, stay long, but on your stops. ASHR for Miss Susan. Yeah, this is the, um, are you looking at my Landry list? I always do that. <laughs> um, that's a China tracking stock, or one of the China tracking stocks, which is in the um, what you're seeing right here. It's in the DBX trackers. I've got that in the Landry list, Landry 100. Um, yeah, it's kind of choppy. I wouldn't personally trade it, but you know, for like a momentum list tracker, it's kind of a cool thing to have in that. FXI too, yeah, that's another one of those Chinese things. FXI. Oh, okay. So you're saying that you, yeah, this China stock's kind of breaking out. That's a good thing. Uh, obviously, we don't see China go under, uh, especially as they own more and more. GMCR is a potential short. That's ironic because we made that a, uh, we made that an example. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's kind of wide and loose. I hear you though. Uh, it kind of pulled back into this prior little base. You know, it would actually have to break down out of this base before me to get excited about it. Looks like we talked about it last week or back in, in December as a um, 
or November as a first thrust. Okay, we're we're running out of time, so let's let's squeeze in a few more real quick. EGRX. Uh, we talked about that one. Yeah, uh, WR. Uh, utilities. Yeah, we did that one. SHLX. Uh, this is kind of interesting. It's a little on the thin side. It's a higher price IPO. Uh, maybe this is a tough. I'm gonna say no. Um, I'd like to see more of a of a of a defined move higher, and then look to uh, play a pullback. So I think I would pass on that one. Okay, you're welcome, Eric. Well, look, I better go ahead and wrap things up before um, the recording gets uh, too hard to manage. I I love doing these shows, as you can tell. I appreciate you guys coming. I, I know I went a little long this week. Next week, I'll um, I'll try to uh, contain the material a little bit so we have more time for the charts. Uh, it is a week of charts, right? Anyway. Thanks for showing up. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. Any uh, follow-up questions, DavidDaveLandry.com. Everybody have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk again. And uh, if not, uh, I'll see you again next week. Thank you so much.